The Man Without a Country by Edward Everett Hale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Roddy Delaney, Idaho, USA, September 2007. The Man Without a Country by Edward Everett Hale. I suppose that very few casual readers of the New York Herald of August 18th observed, in an obscure corner, among the deaths, the announcement, Nolan, died on board U.S. Corvette Levant, latitude 2 degrees 11 minutes south, longitude 131 degrees west, on the 11th of May, Philip Nolan. I happened to observe it, because I was stranded at the old mission house in Mackinac, waiting for a Lake Superior steamer which did not choose to come, and I was devouring to the very stubble all the current literature I could get a hold of, even down to the deaths and marriages in the Herald. My memory for names and people is good, and the reader will see, as he goes on, that I had reason enough to remember Philip Nolan. There are hundreds of readers who would have paused at that announcement, if the officer of the Levant who reported it had chosen to make it thus, died May 11th, the man without a country. For it was as the man without a country that poor Philip Nolan had been generally known by the officers who had had him in charge during some fifty years, as, indeed, by all the men who had sailed under them. I dare say there is many a man who has taken wine with him once a fortnight, in a three years' cruise, who never knew that his name was Nolan, or whether the poor wretch had any name at all. There can now be no possible harm in telling this poor creature's story. Reason enough there has been till now, ever since Madison's administration went out in 1817, for very strict secrecy, the secrecy of honor itself, among the gentlemen of the Navy who have had Nolan in successive charge, and certainly it speaks well for the esprit de corps of the profession, and the personal honor of its members, that to the press this man's story has been wholly unknown, and I think to the country at large also. I have reason to think, from some investigations I have made in the Naval Archives when I was attached to the Bureau of Construction, that every official report relating to him was burned when Ross burned the public buildings at Washington. One of the Tuckers, or possibly one of the Watsons, had Nolan in charge at the end of the war, and when, upon returning from his cruise, he reported at Washington to one of the Crown and Shields, who was in the Navy Department when he came home, he found that the Department ignored the whole business. Whether they really knew nothing about it, or whether it was non me recordo, determined on as a piece of policy, I do not know. But this I do know, that since 1817, and possibly before, no naval officer has mentioned Nolan in his report of a cruise. But, as I say, there is no need for secrecy any longer, and now the poor creature is dead. It seems to me worth while to tell a little of his story, by way of showing young Americans of today what it is to be a man without a country. Philip Nolan was as fine a young officer as there was in the Legion of the West, as the Western Division of our army was then called. When Aaron Burr made his first dashing expedition down to Orleans in 1805 at Fort Massac, or somewhere above on the river, he met, as the devil would have it, this gay, dashing, bright young fellow at some dinner party, I think. Burr marked him, talked to him, walked with him, took a day or two's voyage on his flatboat, and, in short, fascinated him. For the next year, barrack life was very tame for poor Nolan. He occasionally availed himself of the permission the great man had given him to write to him. Long, high-worded, stilted letters the poor boy wrote and rewrote and copied, but never a line did he have in reply from the gay deceiver. The other boys in the garrison sneered at him, because he sacrificed, in this unrequited affection for a politician, the time that they devoted to the Monongahela, Hazard, and High-Low Jack. Bourbon, euchre, and poker were still unknown, but one day Nolan had his revenge. This time Burr came down the river, not as an attorney seeking a place for his office, but as a distinguished conqueror. 
He had defeated I know not how many district attorneys. He had dined at I know not how many public dinners. He had been heralded in I know not how many weekly Arguses, and it was rumored that he had an army behind him and an empire before him. It was a great day, his arrival, to poor Nolan. Burr had not been at the fort an hour before he sent for him. That evening he asked Nolan to take him out in his skiff, to show him a canebrake or a cottonwood tree, as he said, really to seduce him. And by the time the sale was over, Nolan was enlisted body and soul. From that time, though he did not yet know it, he lived as a man without a country. What Burr meant to do, I know no more than you, dear reader. It is none of our business just now. Only, when the grand catastrophe came, and Jefferson and the House of Virginia of that day undertook to break on the wheel all the possible clearances of the then House of New York, by the great treason trial at Richmond, some of the lesser fry in that distant Mississippi Valley, which is farther from us than Puget Sound is to-day, introduced the like novelty on their provincial stage, and, to while away the monotony of the summer at Fort Adams, got up for spectacles a string of court-martials on the officers there. One and another of the colonels and majors was tried, and, to fill out the list, little Nolan, against whom, heaven knows, there was evidence enough that he was sick of the service, had been willing to be false to it, and would have obeyed any order to march, any whither, with any one who would follow him, had the order been signed, by command of His Excellency A. Burr. The courts dragged on. The big flies escaped, rightly for all I know. Nolan was proved guilty, as I say, yet you and I would never have heard of him, reader, but that, when the President of the Court asked him at the close whether he wished to say anything to show that he had always been faithful to the United States, he cried out in a fit of frenzy, "'Damn the United States! I wish I may never hear of the United States again!' I suppose he did not know how the words shocked Colonel Morgan, who was holding the Court. Half of the officers who sat in it had served through the Revolution, and their lives, not to say their necks, had been risked for the very idea he so cavalierly cursed in his madness. He, on his part, had grown up in the west of those days, in the midst of the Spanish plot, Orleans plot, and all the rest. He had been educated on a plantation, where the finest company was a Spanish officer or a French merchant from Orleans. His education, such as it was, had been perfected in commercial expeditions to Vera Cruz, and I think he told me his father once hired an Englishman to be a private tutor for a winter on the plantation. He spent half his youth with an older brother hunting horses in Texas, and to him United States was scarcely a reality. Yet he had been fed by United States for all the years since he had been in the army. He had sworn on his faith as a Christian to be true to United States. It was United States which gave him the uniform he wore, and the sword by his side. Nay, my poor Nolan, it was only because United States had picked you out first as one of her own confidential men of honor that A. Burr cared for you a straw more than for the flatboat men who sailed his ark for him. I do not excuse Nolan. I only explain to the reader why he damned his country, and wished he might never hear her name again. He never did hear her name but once again. From that moment, September twenty third, 1807, till the day he died, May eleventh, 1863, he never heard her name again. For that half-century and more, he was a man without a country. Old Morgan, as I said, was terribly shocked. If Nolan had compared George Washington to Benedict Arnold, or had cried, God save King George, Morgan would not have felt worse. He called the court into his private room, and returned in fifteen minutes, with a face like a sheet, to say, Prisoner, hear the sentence of the court. The court decides, subject to the approval of the President, that you never hear the name United States again. Nolan laughed, but nobody else laughed. Old Morgan was too solemn, and the whole room was hushed dead as night for a minute. Even Nolan lost his swagger in a moment. Then Morgan added, Mr. Marshall, take the prisoner to Orleans in an armed boat, and deliver him to the naval commander there. 
The marshal gave his orders, and the prisoner was taken out of the court. Mr. Marshal, continued old Morgan, see that no one mentions the United States to the prisoner. Mr. Marshal, make my respects to Lieutenant Mitchell at Orleans, and request him to order that no one shall mention the United States to the prisoner while he is on board ship. You will receive your written orders from the officer on duty here this evening. The court is adjourned without day. I have always supposed that Colonel Morgan himself took the proceedings of the court to Washington City, and explained them to Mr. Jefferson. Certain it is that the President approved them. Certain, that is, if I may believe the men who say they have seen his signature. Before the Nautilus got round from New Orleans to the North Atlantic coast with the prisoner on board, the sentence had been approved, and he was a man without a country. The plan then adopted was substantially the same as was necessarily followed ever after. Perhaps it was suggested by the necessity of sending him by water from Fort Adams to Orleans. The Secretary of the Navy, it must have been the first crown and shield, though he is a man I do not remember, was requested to put Nolan on board a vessel bound on a long cruise, and to direct that he should be only so far confined there as to make it certain that he never saw or heard of the country. We had few cruises then, and the Navy was very much out of favor, and as almost all of this story is traditional, as I have explained, I do not know certainly what his first cruise was. But the commander to whom he was entrusted, perhaps it was Tingey or Shaw, though I think it was one of the younger men, we are all old enough now, regulated the etiquette and the precautions of the affair, and according to his scheme they were carried out, I suppose, till Nolan died. When I was second officer of the Intrepid, some thirty years after, I saw the original paper of instructions. I have been sorry ever since that I did not copy the whole of it. It ran, however, much in this way. Washington, with a date which have been late in 1807. Sir, you will receive from Lieutenant Neal the person of Philip Nolan, late lieutenant of the United States Army. This person, on his trial by court-martial, expressed with an oath the wish that he might never hear of the United States again. The court has sentenced him to have his wish fulfilled. For the present, the execution of this order is entrusted by the President of this Department. You will take the prisoner on board your ship and keep him there with such precautions as shall prevent his escape. You will provide him with such quarters, rations, and clothing as would be proper for an officer of his late rank if he were a passenger on your ship on the business of his government. The gentlemen on board will make any arrangements agreeable to themselves regarding his society. He is to be exposed to no indignity of any kind, nor is he ever to unnecessarily be reminded that he is a prisoner. But under no circumstances is he ever to hear of his country, or see any information regarding it, and you will specially caution all the officers under your command to take care that, in the various indulgences which may be granted, this rule in which his punishment is involved shall not be broken. It is the intention of the government that he shall never again see the country which he has disowned. Before the end of your cruise, you will receive orders which will give effect to this intention. Respectfully yours, W. Southard, for the Secretary of the Navy. If I had only preserved the whole of this paper, there would be no break in the beginning of my sketch of this story. For Captain Shaw, if it were he, handed it to his successor in the charge, and he to his, and I suppose the commander of the Levant has it to-day as his authority for keeping this man in this mild custody. The rule adopted on board the ships on which I have met the man without a country was, I think, transmitted from the beginning. No mess liked to have him permanently, because his presence cut off all talk of home, or of the prospect of return, of politics or letters, of peace or war, cut off more than half the talk men like to have at sea. But it was always thought too hard that he should never meet the rest of us, except to touch hats, and we finally sank into one system. He was not permitted to talk to the men unless an officer was by. With officers he had unrestrained intercourse, as far as they and he chose. But he grew shy, 
though he had his favorites, I was one. Then the captain always asked him to dinner on Monday. Every mess in succession took up invitation in its turn. According to the size of the ship, you had him at your mess more or less often at dinner. His breakfast he ate in his own stateroom. He always had a stateroom, which was where a sentinel or somebody on watch could see the door. And whatever else he ate or drank, he ate or drank alone. Sometimes, when the Marines or sailors had any special jollification, they were permitted to invite plain buttons, as they called him. Then Nolan was sent with some officer, and the men were forbidden to speak of home while he was there. I believe the theory that the sight of his punishment did them good. They called him plain buttons, because, while he chose to wear a regulation army uniform, he was not permitted to wear the army button, for the reason that it bore either the initials or the insignia of the country he had disowned. I remember, soon after I joined the Navy, I was on shore with some of the older officers from our ship, and from the Brandywine, which we had met at Alexandria. We had leave to make a party, and go up to Cairo and the pyramids. As we jogged along, you went on donkeys then, some of the gentlemen, we called them dons, but the phrase was long since changed, fell into talking about Nolan, and someone told the system which was adopted from the first about his books and other reading. As he was almost never permitted to go on shore, even though the vessel lay in port for months, his time at best hung heavy, and every one was permitted to lend him books, if they were not published in America, and made no allusion to it. These were common enough in the old days, when people in the other hemisphere talked of the United States as little as we do of Paraguay. He had almost all the foreign newspapers that came into the ship, sooner or later. Only somebody must go over them first, and cut out any advertisement or stray paragraph that alluded to America. This was a little cruel sometimes, when the back of what was cut out might be as innocent as Hesiod. Right in the midst of one of Napoleon's battles, or one of Canning's speeches, poor Nolan would find a great hole, because on the back of the page of that paper there had been an advertisement for a packet for New York, or a scrap from the President's message. I say this was the first time I ever heard of this plan, which afterwards I had enough and more than enough to do with. I remember it because poor Phillips, who was a part of that party, as soon as the allusion to reading was made, told a story of something which happened at the Cape of Good Hope on Nolan's first voyage, and it was the only time I knew of that voyage. They had touched at the Cape, and done the civil thing with the English admiral and the fleet, and then, leaving for a long cruise up the Indian Ocean, Phillips had borrowed a lot of English books from an officer, which, in those days, as indeed in these, was quite a windfall. Among them, as the devil would order, was the Lay of the Last Minstrel, which they had all of them heard of, but which most of them had never seen. I think it could not have been published long. Well, nobody thought there could be any risk of anything national in that though Phillips swore old Shaw had cut out the Tempest from Shakespeare before he let Nolan have it, because he said the Bermudas ought to be ours, and, by Jove, should be one day. So Nolan was permitted to join the circle one afternoon, when a lot of them sat on deck smoking and reading aloud. People do not do such things so often now, but when I was young, we got rid of a great deal of time so. Well, so it happened that in his turn Nolan took the book and read to the others, and he read very well, as I know. Nobody in the circle knew a line of the poem, only it was all magic and border chivalry, and was ten thousand years ago. Poor Nolan read steadily through the fifth canto, stopped a minute and drank something, and then began, without a thought of what was coming. Breathes there a man with soul so dead, who never to himself hath said. It seems impossible to us that anybody ever heard this for the first time. But all of these fellows did then, and poor Nolan himself went on, still unconsciously or mechanically. This is my own, my native land. Then they all saw something was to pay, but he expected to get through, I suppose, turned a little pale, but plunged on.
whose heart hath ne'er within him burned, as home his footsteps he hath turned, from wandering on a foreign strand? If such there breathe, go, mark him well. By this time the men were all beside themselves, wishing there was any way to make him turn over two pages. But he had not quite presence of mind for that. He gagged a little, colored crimson, and staggered on. For him no minstrel raptures swell. High though his titles, proud his name, boundless his wealth, as wish can claim. Despite these titles, power and pelf, the wretch concentrated all in self. And here the poor fellow choked, could not go on, but started up, swung the book into the sea, vanished into his stateroom. And by Jove, said Phillips, we did not see him for two months again, and I had to make up some beggarly story to that English surgeon why I did not return his Walter Scott to him. That story shows about the time when Nolan's braggadocio must have broken down. At first, they said, he took a very high tone, considered his imprisonment a mere farce, affected to enjoy the voyage, and all that, but Phillips said that after he came out of his stateroom he was never the same man again. He never read aloud again, unless it was the Bible, or Shakespeare, or something else he was sure of. But it was not that merely. He never entered in with the other young men exactly as a companion again. He was always shy afterwards, when I knew him, very seldom spoke, unless he was spoken to, except to a very few friends. He lighted up occasionally. I remember late in his life hearing him fairly eloquent on something which had been suggested to him by one of the Flechier's sermons, but generally he had the nervous, tired look of a heart-wounded man. When Captain Shaw was coming home, if, as I say, it was Shaw, rather to the surprise of everybody they made one of the windward islands and lay off and on for nearly a week the boys said the officers were sick of salt junk and meant to have turtle soup before they came home but after several days the warren came to the same rendezvous they exchanged signals she sent to phillips and these homeward bound men letters and papers and told them she was outward bound perhaps to the mediterranean and took poor Nolan and his traps on the boat back to try his second cruise. He looked blank when he was told to get ready to join her. He had known enough of the signs of the sky to know that till that moment he was going home. But this was a distinct evidence of something that he had not thought of, perhaps, that there was no going home for him, even to a prison and this was the first of some twenty such transfers which brought him sooner or later into half of our best vessels but which kept him all his life at least some one hundred miles from the country he had hoped he might never hear of again it may have been on that second cruise it was once when he was up the mediterranean that mrs graff the celebrated southern beauty of those days danced with him they had been lying a long time in the Bay of Naples, and the officers were very intimate in the English fleet, and there had been great festivities, and our men thought they must give a great ball on board the ship. How they ever did it on board the Warren, I am sure I do not know. Perhaps it was not the Warren, or perhaps ladies did not take up so much room as they do now. They wanted to use Nolan's stateroom for something, and they hated to do it without asking him to the ball. So the captain said they might ask him, if they would be responsible, that he did not talk to the wrong people, who would give him intelligence. So the dance went on, the finest party that had ever been known, I dare say, for I have never heard of a man-of-war ball that was not. For ladies, they had the family of the American consul, one or two travelers, who had adventured so far, and a nice bevy of English girls and matrons, perhaps even Lady Hamilton herself. Well. Different officers relieved each other in standing and talking with Nolan, in a friendly way, so as to be sure that nobody else spoke to him. The dancing went on with spirit, and after a while even the fellows who took this honorary guard of Nolan ceased to fear any contretemps. Only when some English lady, Lady Hamilton, as I said, perhaps, called for a set of American dances, an odd thing happened. Everybody then danced contra-dances. The black band, nothing loath, conferred as to what American dances were, and started off with a Virginia reel, which they followed with Money Musk, 
which in its turn in those days should have been followed by the old thirteen but just as dick the leader tapped his fiddles to begin and bent forward about to say in true negro state the old thirteen ladies and gentlemen as he had said for Jenny Reel, if you please, and Money Musk, if you please, the captain's boy tapped him on the shoulder, whispered to him, and he did not announce the name of the dance. He merely bowed, began on the air, and they all fell to, the officers teaching the English girls the figure, but not telling them why it had no name. But that is not the story I started to tell. As the dancing went on, Noland and our fellows all got at ease, as I said, so much so, that it seemed quite natural for him to bow to that splendid Mrs. Graff and say, "'I hope you have not forgotten me, Miss Rutledge. Shall I have the honor of dancing?' He did it so quickly that Fellows, who was with him, could not hinder him. She laughed and said, "'I am not Miss Rutledge any longer, Mr. Nolan, but I will dance all the same.' just nodded to Fellows, as if to say leave Mr. Nolan to her, and led him off to the place where the dance was forming. Nolan thought he had got his chance. He had known her at Philadelphia, and at other places had met her, and this was a godsend. You could not talk in contra-dances, as you do in cotillions, or even in the pauses of waltzing, but there were chances for tongues and sounds, as well as eyes and blushes. He began with her travels, and Europe, and Vesuvius, and the French, and then, when they had worked down, and had that long talking time at the bottom of the set, he said, boldly, a little pale, she said, as she told me the story years after, and what do you hear from home, Mrs. Graff? And that splendid creature looked through him. Jove, how she must have looked through him. Home, Mr. Nolan? I thought you were the man who never wanted to hear of home again. And she walked directly up the deck to her husband, and left poor Nolan alone, as he always was. He did not dance again. I cannot give any history of him in order. Nobody can now. And, indeed, I am not trying to. These are the traditions which I sort out, as I believe them, from the myths which I have been told about this man for forty years. The lies that have been told about him are legion. The fellows used to say he was the Iron Mask, and poor George Pons went to his grave in the belief that this was the author of Junius, who was being punished for his celebrated libel on Thomas Jefferson. Pons was not very strong in the historical line. A happier story than either of these I have told is of the war. That came along soon after. I have heard this affair told in three or four ways and, indeed, it may have happened more than once. But which ship it was on I cannot tell. However, in one at least of the great frigate duels with the English, in which our navy was really baptized, it happened that a round shot from the enemy entered one of our ports square, and took right down the officer of the gun himself, and almost every man in the gun's crew. Now you may say what you choose about courage, but that is not a nice thing to see. But as the men who were not killed picked themselves up, and as they and the surgeon's people were carrying off the bodies, there appeared Nolan, in his shirt-sleeves, with a rammer in his hand, and, just as if he had been the officer, told them off with authority, who should go to the cockpit with the wounded men, who should stay with him, perfectly cheery, and with that way that makes men feel sure all is right, and is going to be right and he finished loading the gun with his own hands, aimed it, and bade the men fire. And there he stayed, captain of the gun, keeping those fellows in spirits, till the enemy struck, sitting on the carriage while the gun was cooling, though he was exposed all the time, showing them easier ways to handle heavy shot, making the raw hands laugh at their own blunders, and when the gun cooled again, getting it loaded and fired twice as often as any other gun on the ship. The captain walked forward by way of encouraging the men, and Nolan touched his hat and said, I am showing them how we do this in the artillery, sir. And this is the part of the story where all the legends agree, and the commodore said, I see you do, and I thank you, sir, and I shall never forget this day, sir, and you never shall, sir. And after the whole thing was over, and he had the Englishman's sword. In the midst of the state and ceremony of the quarter-deck, he said, Where is Mr. Nolan? Ask Mr. Nolan to come here. 
And when Mr. Nolan came, the captain said, Mr. Nolan, we are very grateful to you today. You are one of us today, and you will be named in the dispatches. And then the old man took off his own sword of ceremony, and gave it to Nolan, and made him put it on. The man told me this who saw it. Nolan cried like a baby, and well he might. He had not worn a sword since that infernal day at Fort Adams. But always afterwards, on occasions of ceremony, he wore that quaint old French sword of the Commodore's. The captain did mention him in the dispatches. It was said that he asked that he might be pardoned. He wrote a special letter to the Secretary of War, but nothing ever came of it. As I said, that was about the time they began to ignore the whole transaction at Washington, and when Nolan's imprisonment began to carry itself on because there was nobody to stop it without any new orders from home. I have heard it said that he was with Porter when he took possession of the Nukahiwa Islands, not this Porter, you know, but old Porter, his father, Essex Porter, that is, the old Essex Porter, not this Essex. As an artillery officer, who had seen service in the West, Nolan knew more about fortifications, embrasures, ravelins, stockades, and all that, than any of them did, and he worked with a right good will in fixing that battery all right. I have always thought it was a pity Porter did not leave him in command there with Gamble. That would have settled all the questions about his punishment. We should have kept the islands, and at this moment we should have one station in the Pacific Ocean. Our French friends, too, when they wanted this little watering place, would have found it was preoccupied. But Madison, and the Virginians, of course, flung it all away. All that was near fifty year ago. If Nolan was thirty then, he must have been near eighty when he died. He looked sixty when he was forty. But he never seemed to me to have changed a hair afterwards. As I imagine his life, from what I have seen and heard of it, he must have been in every sea, and yet almost never on land. He must have known, in a formal way, more officers in our service than any man living knows. He told me once, with a grave smile, that no man in the world lived so methodical a life as he. You know the boys say I am the Iron Mask, and you know how busy he was. He said it did not do for anyone to try and read all the time, more than do anything else all the time, but that he read just five hours a day. Then, he said, I keep up my notebooks, writing in them at such and such hours from what I have been reading, and I include in these my scrapbooks. These were very curious indeed. He had six or eight of different subjects. There was one of history, one of natural science, one of which he called odds and ends. But they were not merely books of extracts from newspapers. They had bits of plants and ribbons, shells tied on, and carved scraps of bone and wood, which he had taught the men to cut for him, and they were beautifully illustrated. He drew admirably. He had some of the funniest drawings there, and some of the most pathetic I had ever seen in my life. I wonder who will have Nolan's scrapbooks. Well, he said his reading and his notes were his profession and they took five hours and two hours respectively each day then he said every man should have a diversion as well as a profession my natural history is my diversion that took two hours a day more the men used to bring him birds and fish but on a long cruise he had to satisfy himself with centipedes and cockroaches and such small game he was the only naturalist i ever met who knew anything about the habits of the housefly and the mosquito all those people can tell you whether they are Lepidoptera or Stepidoptera, but as for telling you how to get rid of them, or how they get away from you when you strike, why, Lincius knew as little of that as John Foy the idiot did. These nine hours made Nolan's regular daily occupation. The rest of the time he talked or walked. Till he grew very old, he went aloft a great deal. He always kept up his exercise, and I never heard that he was ill. If any other man was ill, he was the kindest nurse in the world, and he knew more than half the surgeons do. Then, if anybody was sick, or died, or if the captain wanted him to, on any other occasion, he was always ready to read prayers. I have said that he read beautifully. My own acquaintance with Philip Nolan began six or eight years after the war, on my first voyage after I was appointed a midshipman. 
It was in the first days after our slave trade treaty, while the reigning house, which was still the House of Virginia, had still a sort of sentimentalism about the suppression of the horrors of the Middle Passage, and something was sometimes done that way. We were in the South Atlantic on that business. From the time I joined, I believe I thought Nolan was a sort of a lay chaplain, a chaplain with a blue coat. I never ask about him. Everything in the ship was strange to me. I knew it was green to ask questions, and I suppose I thought there was a plain buttons on every ship. We had him to dine in our mess once a week, and the caution was given that on that day nothing was to be said about home. But if they had told us not to say anything about the planet Mars, or the book of Deuteronomy, I should not have asked why. There were a great many things which seemed to me to have as little reason. I first came to understand anything about the man without a country, one day when we overhauled a dirty little schooner which had slaves on board. An officer was sent to take charge of her, and, after a few minutes, he sent his boat back to ask that some one might be sent to him who could speak Portuguese. We were all looking over the rail when that message came, and we all wished that we could interpret, when the captain asked who spoke Portuguese. But none of the officers did, and just as the captain was sending forward to ask if any of the people could, Nolan stepped out and said that he should be glad to interpret, if the captain wished, as he spoke the language. The captain thanked him, fitted out another boat with him, and in this boat it was my luck to go. When we got there, it was such a scene as you seldom see, and never want to, nastiness beyond account, and chaos ran loose in the midst of the nastiness. There were not a great many of the negroes, but by way of making what there were understand that they were free, Vaughn had had their handcuffs and ankle cuffs knocked off, and, for convenience sake, was putting them upon the rascals of the schooner's crew. The negroes were, for the most part, out of the hold, and swarming around the dirty deck, with the central throng surrounding Vaughn, and addressing him in every dialect, and patois of a dialect, from the Zulu clique up to the Parisian of Belladelgerad. As we came on deck, Vaughn looked down from the hogshead, on which he was mounted in desperation, and said, For God's love, is there anybody who can make these wretches understand something? The men gave them rum, and that did not quiet them. I knocked that big fellow down twice, and that did not soothe him. And then I talked Choctaw to all of them together, and I'll be hanged if they understood that as well as they understood the English. Nolan said he could speak Portuguese, and one or two of the fine-looking crewmen were dragged out, who, it had been found already, had worked for the Portuguese on the coast at Fernando Po. "'Tell them they are free,' said Vaughn, "'and tell them that these rascals are to be hanged "'as soon as we can get rope enough.' "'Nolan put that into Spanish. "'That is, he explained it in such Portuguese "'as the crewmen could understand, "'and they in turn to such of those negroes "'who could understand them. "'Then there was such a yell of delight, "'clinching of fists, leaping and dancing, "'kissing of Nolan's feet, "'and a general rush made to the hogshead, by way of spontaneous worship of Vaughn, as the dulce ex machina of the occasion. Tell them, Vaughn said, well pleased, that I will take them to Cape Palmas. This did not answer so well. Cape Palmas was practically as far from the homes of most of them as New Orleans or Rio Janeiro was, that is, they would be eternally separated from their home there. And their interpreters, as we could understand, instantly said, Ah, non Palmas! and began to propose infinite other expeditions in most voluble language. Vaughn was rather disappointed at this result of his liberality, and asked Nolan eagerly what they said. The drops stood on poor Nolan's white forehead, as he hushed the men down, and said, He says, not Palmas. He says, Take us home. Take us to our own country. Take us to our own house. Take us to our own pickaninnies and our own women. He says he has an old father and mother, who will die if they do not see him. And this one says he left his people all sick, and paddled down to Fernando to beg the white doctor to come and help them, and that these devils caught him in the bay just in sight of home, and that he has never seen any one from home since then. And this one says, choked out Nolan, that he has not heard a word from his home in six months, while he has been locked up in an infernal barracoon. Vaughn always said he grew gray himself while Nolan struggled through this interpretation. 
I, who did not understand anything of the passion involved in it, saw that the very elements were melting with fervent heat, and that something was to pay somewhere. Even the negroes themselves stopped howling, as they saw Nolan's agony, and Vaughn's almost equal agony of sympathy. As quick as he could get words, he said, "'Tell them, yes, yes, yes. Tell them they shall go to the mountains of the moon, if they will. If I sail the schooner through the great white desert, they shall go home.' And after some fashion Nolan said so and then they all fell to kissing him again and wanted to rub his nose with theirs but he could not stand it long and getting vaughn to say that he might go back he beckoned me down into our boat as we lay back in the stern sheets and the men gave way he said to me youngster let that show you what it is to be without a family without a home and without a country and if you are ever tempted to say a word or do a thing that shall put a bar between you and your family, your home, and your country, pray God in His mercy to take you that instant home to His own heaven. Stick by your family, boy. Forget you have a self while you do everything for them. Think of your home, boy. Write and send and talk about it. Let it be nearer and nearer to your thought the further you travel from it and rush back to it when you are free as that poor black slave is doing now and for your country boy and the words rattled in his throat and for that flag and he pointed to the ship never dream a dream but of serving her as she bids you though the service carry you through a thousand hells no matter what happens to you no matter who flatters you or who abuses you never look at another flag never let a night pass but you pray god to bless that flag Remember, boy, that behind all these men you have to do with, behind officers and government and people even, there is the country herself, your country, and that you belong to her as you belong to your own mother. Stand by her, boy, as you would stand by your mother if those devils there got hold of her today. I was frightened to death by his calm, hard passion, but I blundered out that I would by all that was holy, and that I had never thought of doing anything else. He hardly seemed to hear me, but he did, almost in a whisper, say, Oh, if anybody had said so to me when I was of your age. I think it was this half-confidence of his, which I never abused, for I never told this story till now, which afterward made us great friends. He was very kind to me. Often he sat up, or even got up, at night, to walk the deck with me when it was my watch. He explained to me a great deal of my mathematics, and I owe to him my taste for mathematics. He lent me books, and helped me about my reading. He never alluded so directly to his story again, but from one and another officer I have learned in thirty years what I am telling. When we parted from him in St. Thomas Harbor, at the end of our cruise, I was more sorry than I can tell. I was very glad to meet him again in 1830, and in later life, when I thought I had some influence in Washington, I moved heaven and earth to have him discharged, but it was like getting a ghost out of prison. They pretended that there was no such man, and never was such a man. They will say so at the department now. Perhaps they do not know. It will not be the first thing in this service of which the department appears to know nothing. There is a story that Nolan met Burr once on one of our vessels, when a party of Americans came on board in the Mediterranean. But this I believe to be a lie, or, rather, it is a myth, Ben Travato, involving a tremendous blowing up with which he sank Burr, asking him how he liked to be without a country. But it is clear from Burr's life that nothing of the sort could have happened. And I mention this only as an illustration of the stories that get a-going where there is the least mystery at bottom. So poor Philip Nolan had his wish fulfilled. I know but one fate more dreadful. It is the fate reserved for those men who shall have one day to exile themselves from their country because they have attempted her ruin, and shall have at the same time to see the prosperity and honor to which she rises when she has rid herself of them and their inequities. The wish of poor Nolan, as we learn to call him, not because his punishment was too great, but because his repentance was so clear was precisely the wish of every brag and beauregard who broke a soldier's oath two years ago and every maury and baron who broke a sailor's i do not know how often they have repented 
I do know that they have done all that in them lay, that they might have no country, that all the honors, associations, memories, and hopes which belong to country might be broken up into little shreds and distributed to the winds. I know, too, that their punishment, as they vegetate through the rest of what is left of life to them in wretched Boulons and Leicester squares, where they are destined to upbraid each other till they die, will have all the agony of Nolan's, with the added pang that every one who sees them will see them to despise and to execrate them. They will have their wish, like him. For him, poor fellow, he repented his folly, and then, like a man, submitted to the fate he had asked for. He never intentionally added to the difficulty or delicacy of the charge of those who had him in hold. Accidents would happen, but they never happened from his fault. Lieutenant Truxton told me that when Texas was annexed, there was a careful discussion among the officers whether they should get hold of Nolan's handsome set of maps and cut Texas out of it from the map of the world and the map of Mexico. The United States had been cut out when the atlas was bought for him, but it was voted, rightly enough, that to do this would be virtually to reveal to him what had happened, or, as Harry Cole said, to make him think old Burr had succeeded. So it was from no fault of Nolan's that a great botch happened at my own table when, for a short time, I was in command of the George Washington Corvette on the South American station. We were lying in the La Plata, and some of the officers who had been on shore and had just joined again were entertaining us with accounts of their misadventures in riding the half-wild horses of Buenos Aires. Nolan was at table, and was in an unusually bright and talkative mood. Some story of a tumble reminded him of an adventure of his own when he was catching wild horses in Texas with his adventurous cousin at a time when he must have been quite a boy. He told the story with a good deal of spirit, so much so that the silence which often follows a good story hung over the table for an instant, to be broken by Nolan himself, for he asked perfectly unconsciously, "'Pray, what has become of Texas?' After the Mexicans got their independence, I thought that the province of Texas would come forward very fast. It is really one of the finest regions on earth. It is the Italy of this continent. But I have not seen or heard a word of Texas for near twenty years. There were two Texan officers at the table. The reason he had never heard of Texas was that Texas and her affairs had been painfully cut out of the newspapers since Austin began his settlements, so that, while he read of Honduras and Tamaulipas, and till quite lately of California, this virgin province in which his brother had traveled so far, and, I believe, had died, had ceased to be to him. Waters and Williams, the two Texas men, looked grimly at each other, and tried not to laugh. Edward Morris had his attention attracted by the third link in the chain of the captain's chandelier. Watrous was seized by a convulsion of sneezing. Nolan himself saw that something was to pay. He did not know what, and I, as master of the feast, had to say, Texas is out of the map, Mr. Nolan. Have you seen Captain Back's curious account of Sir Thomas Rowe's welcome? After that cruise I never saw Nolan again. I wrote to him at least twice a year, for in that voyage we became even confidentially intimate, but he never wrote to me. The other men tell me that in those fifteen years he aged very fast, as well he might indeed, but that he was still the same gentle, uncomplaining, silent sufferer that he ever was, bearing as best he could his self-appointed punishment, rather less social, perhaps, with new men whom he did not know, but more anxious, apparently, than ever to serve and befriend and teach the boys, some of whom fairly seemed to worship him. And now it seems the dear old fellow is dead. He has found a home, at last, and a country. Since writing this, and while considering whether or not I would print it as a warning to young Nolans and Vlandinghams and Tatnalls of today, of what it is to throw away a country, I have received from Danforth, who is on board the Levitt, a letter which gives an account of Nolan's last hours. To understand the first words of the letter,
the non-professional reader should remember that after 1817 the position of every officer who had Nolan in charge was one of the greatest delicacy. The government had failed to renew the order of 1807 regarding him. What was a man to do? Should he let him go? What then if he were called to account by the department for violating the order of 1807? Should he keep him? What then if Nolan should be liberated some day, and should bring an action for false imprisonment or kidnapping against every man who had had him in charge? I urged and pressed this upon Southard, and I have reason to think that other officers did the same thing. But the secretary always said, as they so often do at Washington, that there were no special orders to give, that we must act on our own judgment. That means, if you succeed, you will be sustained. If you fail, you will be disavowed. Well, as Danforth says, all that is over now, though I do not know, but I expose myself to a criminal prosecution on the evidence of the very revelation I am making. Here is the letter. Levant, 2 degrees 2 minutes south, at 131 degrees west. Dear Fred, I try to find heart and life to tell you that it is all over with dear old Nolan. I have been with him on this voyage more than I ever was, and I can understand wholly now the way in which you used to speak of the dear old fellow. I could see that he was not strong, but I had no idea the end was so near. The doctor has been watching him very carefully, and yesterday morning came to me and told me that Nolan was not so well, and had not left his stateroom a thing I never remember before. He had let the doctor come and see him as he lay there, the first time the doctor had been in the stateroom, and he said he should like to see me. Oh, dear, do you remember the mysteries we boys used to invent about his room in the old intrepid days? Well, I went in, and there, to be sure, the poor fellow lay in his berth, smiling pleasantly as he gave me his hand, but looking very frail. I could not help a glance around, which showed me a little shrine he had made of the box he was lying in. The stars and stripes were triced up above and around a picture of Washington, and he had painted a majestic eagle with lightnings blazing from his beak and his foot just clasping the whole globe which his wings overshadowed. The dear boy saw my glance and said with a sad smile, Here, you see, I have a country and then he pointed to the foot of his bed, where I had not seen before a great map of the United States, as he had drawn it from memory, and which he had there to look upon as he lay. Quaint, queer old names were on it, in large letters, Indian Territory, Mississippi Territory, Louisiana Territory, as I suppose our fathers learned such things. But the old fellow had patched in Texas, too, and had carried his western boundary all the way to the Pacific, but on that shore he defined nothing. Oh, Danforth, he said, I know I am dying. I cannot get home. Surely you will tell me something now. Stop, stop, do not speak till I say what I am sure you know, that there is not in this ship, that there is not in America, God bless her, a more loyal man than I. There cannot be a man who loves the old flag as I do, or prays for it as I do, or hopes for it as I do. There are thirty-four stars in it now, Danforth. I thank God for that, though I do not know what their names are. There has never been one taken away. I thank God for that. I know by that that there has never been a successful burr. Oh, Danforth, Danforth, he sighed out, how like a wretched knight's dream, a boy's idea of personal fame, or a separate sovereignty seems when one looks back on it after a life such as mine. But tell me, tell me something, tell me everything, Danforth, before I die. Ingham, I swear to you that I felt like a monster, that I had not told him everything before, danger or no danger, delicacy or no delicacy. Who was I that I should have been acting the tyrant all this time over this dear, sainted old man, who had years ago expiated in his whole manhood's life the madness of a boy's treason? Mr. Nolan, I said, I will tell you everything you ask about. Only, where shall I begin? Oh, the blessed smile that crept over his white face! And he pressed my hand and said, 
God bless you. Tell me their names, he said. He pointed to the stars on the flag. The last I know is Ohio. My father lived in Kentucky, but I have guessed Michigan and Indiana and Mississippi. That was where Fort Adams is. They make twenty. But where are your other fourteen? You have not cut up any of the old ones, I hope. Well, that was not a bad text, and I told him the names in as good order as I could, and he bade me take down his beautiful map and draw them in as best I could with my pencil. He was wild with delight about Texas. He told me how his cousin died there. He had marked a gold cross near where he supposed his grave was, and he had guessed at Texas. Then he was delighted as he saw California and Oregon. That, he said, he had suspected partly, because he had never been permitted to land on that shore, though the ships were there so much. And the men, he said, brought off a good deal besides furs. Then he went back, heaven knows how far, to ask about the Chesapeake, and what was done to Baron for surrendering her to the leopard, and whether Burr ever tried again. And he ground his teeth with the only passion he showed, but in a moment that was over, and he said, God forgive me, for I am sure I forgive him. Then he asked about the old war, told me the true story of his serving the gun the day we took the Java, asked about dear old David Porter, as he called him, then settled down more quietly and very happily to hear me tell in an hour the history of fifty years. How I wished it had been somebody who knew something, but I did as well as I could. I told him of the English war. I told him about Fulton and the steamboat beginning. I told him about Old Scott and Jackson. Told him all I could think of about the Mississippi and New Orleans and Texas and his old Kentucky. And do you think, he asked, who was in command of the Legion of the West? I told him it was a very gallant officer named Grant, and that, by our last news, he was about to establish headquarters at Vicksburg. Then, where was Vicksburg? I worked it out on the map. It was about a hundred miles, more or less, above his old Fort Adams. And I thought Fort Adams must be a ruin now. It must be at Old Vic's plantation at Walnut Hills, he said. Well, that is a change. I tell you, Ingham, it was a hard thing to condense the history of a half-century into that talk with a sick man. And I do not now know what I told him of immigration and the means of it of steamboats and railroads and telegraphs of inventions and books and literature of the colleges and west point and the naval school but with the queerest interpretations that ever you heard you see it was robinson crusoe asking all the accumulated questions of fifty-six years i remember he asked all of a sudden who was president now and when i told him he asked if old abe was general benjamin lincoln's son he said he had met old General Lincoln when he was quite a boy himself at some Indian territory. I said no, that old Abe was a Kentuckian like himself, but I could not tell him of what family. He had worked up from the ranks. Good for him, cried Nolan. I am glad of that. As I have brooded and wondered, I have thought our danger was in keeping up those regular successions in the first families. Then I got talking about my visit to Washington. I told him of meeting the Oregon Congressman Harding. I told him about the Smithsonian and the exploring expedition. I told him about the Capitol and the statues for the pediment, and Crawford's library and Greenhouse, Washington. Ingham, I told him everything I could think of that would show the grandeur of his country and its prosperity. But I could not make my mouth tell him a word about this infernal rebellion and he drank it in, and enjoyed it as I cannot tell you. He grew more and more silent, yet I never thought he was tired or faint. I gave him a glass of water, but he just wet his lips, and told me not to go away. Then he asked me to bring the Presbyterian Book of Public Prayer, which lay there, and said, with a smile, that it would open at the right place, and so it did. There was a double red mark down the page, and I knelt down and read, and he repeated with me, for ourselves and our country o gracious god we thank thee that notwithstanding our manifold transgressions of thy holy laws thou hast continued to us thy marvellous kindness and so to the end of that thanksgiving then he turned to the end of the same book and i read the words more familiar to me 
most heartily we beseech thee with thy favor to behold and bless thy servant the president of the united states and all others in authority and the rest of the episcopal collect danforth he said i have repeated those prayers night and morning it is now fifty-five years and then he said he would go to sleep he bent me down over him and kissed me and said look in my bible danforth when i am gone and i went away but i had no thought it was the end i thought he was tired and would sleep i knew he was happy and i wanted him to be alone but in an hour when the doctor went in gently he found nolan had breathed his life away with a smile he had something pressed close to his lips it was his father's badge of the order of the cincinnati we looked in his bible and there was a slip of paper at the place where he had marked the text they desire a country even a heavenly wherefore god is not ashamed to be called their god for he hath prepared for them a city on the slip of paper he had written bury me in the sea it has been my home and i love it but will not someone set up a stone for my memory at fort adams or at orleans that my disgrace may not be more than i ought to bear say on it in memory of philip nolan lieutenant in the army of the united states he loved his country as no other man has loved her but no man deserved less at her hands End of the man without a country by edward everett hale